nostro Fanto Carriano. Good morning. Uh, thanks, Brooklyn Crew. Thanks for inviting. And uh, thanks for this uh, time slot. I guess organizational team realized like, I'll get drunk soon, so they pushed me to early slot. Um, uh, so let's hope this works. All right. So this talk was developed by my colleague Tigran Georgian and me. And uh, I was supposed to come with Tigran, but he didn't come, but I brought my beautiful wife with me, and that works out better. Because Tigran is a male. My wife is female. Mostly for that. So who we are, uh, both Tigran and I work for Qualys, and we uh, do break stuff. And we also share a couple of other interests, as we like time travel, who doesn't? And we love to try. We love to swing, bike, and run, and looks like Rouge I'm Ghent is a beautiful place for that. But we'll talk about more about breaking stuff and time traveling today, not so much about biking and running. <laughs> So what we will talk about is a method and a tool that we developed uh, which is for stressing your web applications. Then we'll go to some statistics. We will go deep into uh, the defense against the method or any other denial of service attacks, mostly layer seven attacks. Uh, we'll talk about possible usages for the method. So why, why do we decide to uh, spend time on doing some research and writing code and developing a, a talk about it? Uh, because we wanted to buy a time machine. This is a time machine that we tried to buy, uh, you could buy something like this on eBay, but I'm guessing it's not working. So what we developed is kind of a time machine, a time machine that has only one function and it does that function well. And a function of that machine is to give you information from the future about the state of your website. That was a joke. Um, <laughs> so, why, why do we talk about denial of service attacks uh, over, over and over and over again? It's uh, supposed to be very dumb and simple thing and everybody knows how to crash somebody else's machine. Why, why do you come up with new ways of figuring out what to crash, how to crash? And, why all that? Because it's interesting, crashing stuff is fun, and then it's also good to know how to protect stuff, even though you, we can't protect from everything, but it, 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 is, it, it pays off to be prepared. So here is a little bit of uh, taxonomy by Anton Chubakin. Um, this is a denial service classification. So. Basically, sometimes you want to just crash stuff and that's also working because basically the server the system will deny any access to it if it's dead. Then there are a bit more clever methods of resource consumption. Uh, those are on different levels, network level, infrastructure level, or uh, going all the way up to protocol level. and. Uh, and finally, application layer, which we are interested in, and this talk is mostly about that. And there are some new business logic layer attacks, too. So uh, let's talk about application layer denial services. So the good old way is to ch just do lots of gets on index HTML of the web resource and see if it dies. And if you happen to have some money and Russian connections, you can do 
10,000 or 10 million of those simultaneously. Uh, but uh, this method is expensive and, and there's no feedback, you don't see what's going on. And, and uh, resource consumption can be near symmetrical, which means your client, uh, the attacker client and server may suffer similarly. And then are these uh, smarter bots uh, with new breed of DOS tools, slow start tools, uh, slow worry, slow test, uh, slow read. Those, uh, those guys are usually not doing brute force gets or posts. It's more like prolonging the connection, uh, just uh, so reserving stuff on a server that they don't use and they just hamper that and they, they won't let legitimate users to get to those resources. Uh, simply put. And then there will be uh, cases of PKI abuse or cryptographical uh, API calls or renegotiations that will be costly on a server. Uh, SQL wildcards, if are used in any of the fields or forms or uh, any of the resources, if used, if unfiltered, go into web application logic and are part of the SQL statement, it may cause SQL DBs to overheat and stuff like that. And then WebSockets have possibility of helping with all of that because uh, if someone sets up a WebSocket server and uh, doesn't set it up right or, or sets it up by default, a legitimate use would be that you go and connect to it and it keeps the connection alive, which is unlike the regular HTTP transactions. And that is basically like help coming from the server itself and you are uh, doing the slow HTTP read or write or Loris attack without even uh, striving to do that. The, the WebSockets infrastructure does it for you. It keeps the connection alive and then the only thing attackers should do is just open up enough connections to kill the server. Okay, so, um, some exotic level 4 attacks, uh, as we talked about uh, a minute ago, wildcards in a SQL queries could overheat your DB. And uh, uh, this year at uh, DEF CON there was a talk about using gen uh, genetic algorithms for smarter SQL injections. Imagine using the genetic algorithms to come up with uh, harder and uh, stronger wildcards. Basically, uh, wildcards that you fit to the SQL query and it uh, works harder and longer. That could be automated. Uh, some business logic above level uh, layer four attacks would be like uh, if there are flaws in business logic. Uh, attacker could uh, put too many items in a in a cart and overwhelm system, or if logging infrastructure is not optimal and doesn't that doesn't withstand uh, huge traffic, you could have your service degradation on on that end and stuff like that. So what, what, what is the proposed method? Uh, this is not an exotic method. It's, it's just a get flooding that we, uh, we propose. I mean, we don't propose anything really. It's just uh, we are rehashing it and we are providing a tool that will get you a resource that is useful for get flooding. And it will also help you to get flood. Uh, so, it's not exotic, it doesn't do anything fancy, like uh, genetic algorithms are not involved. Um, it's not uh, one of the slow star attacks, it doesn't have the trickling down the data or keeping uh, connections alive kind of problem. And it's not trying to kill your server by just uh, allocating more than 20k of 
connections. Uh, as we will see later on, only five to ten connections sometimes are good enough to take down a very powerful server. So resource consumption is asymmetrical by nature for, for any web transaction because the uh, server really has to work more than uh, a client, unless that client is a browser and it's rendering JavaScript or something terrible. Uh, but if you are just talking about res the request response, that, that cycle is asymmetrical and what we are trying to do to, to, in, to increase the divide here, the, uh, uh, amplify the asymmetric, asymmetrical nature of the HTTP protocol. Uh, so finally, what, what's our method? It's just the get flood. The, with, with some analysis done before the actual attack takes place. Uh, so how do we uh, propose to detect a critical resource? And uh, by critical resource, we mean a resource that consumes lots of CPU or has a DB in intensive uh, stuff. We would uh, use a crawler to go through the whole website if we can. Uh, our crawler uh, that we have right now is not too smart and won't crawl everything, but it's a good beginning. And uh, we also have a way of uh, feeding in data from different crawlers. And then we would uh, continuously request those resources that we found and uh, get average speed on those. And by having average speed, we will make some assumptions that those resources that have worse speed are heavy on the server side. It's that simple, nothing, nothing really smart about this. So we, we think that resource size is not significant because uh, the speed for a standard resource, resource that is not heavy on a server, is going to be more or less constant. And size doesn't matter here, although it may matter in some other places. So what do we have here? Uh, so this is some statistics gathered uh, by running the tool and looking at uh, a couple of commercial and non-commercial uh, CMSs. Uh, you would get a distribution like that where you have uh, your good resources piled up in this bunch uh, and those are slightly, I mean, that, those are normal speed. They, they are fast and probably they don't do anything bad with CPU or, or DB, but then there is this punch that is really slow. And uh, what we are trying to do is to find those in an in a automated way. So, uh, so that, that, that was the kind of the gist of, gist of the method, but then uh, it wouldn't be perfect if my mathematician friend wouldn't start applying some uh, statistical methods to normalize the data. So basically, this is all the mumbo jumbo he wrote here that I don't understand. And uh, he basically tries to find the mean. And uh, the, lo the, slow, the lower is the standard deviation per resource is the highest, higher the uh, confidence is that that prediction or that calculation is <coughs> correct. And then what we do, we will throw away all the resources that have big variance, meaning they, they uh, have high standard deviation, and we end up with confident, a list of 
thing, a list of links that we are confident that will stress the server more than anything else. So uh, here we have four quadrants. In these four quadrants, uh, what we are interested in more is this quadrant where the standard deviation is lower than higher quadrants and the speed is slower than the uh, 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 corner right to it. So whatever drops into this corner, this quadrant is considered to be heavy resource. So time for a demo. So here we run this uh, crawl, crawl on a local host with depth of three, which means do not go deeper than three levels when you find new links. An account would be how many iterations it will test, and then it will drop an XML with uh, data and a the data that it found here is standard deviation um, and the speed. Uh, I'm sorry, the speed and then standard deviation for all the resources. Yeah, and uh, this is sorted. This is sorted, and we have the worst cases on a bottom. Yeah, so it doesn't show me now. Let me scroll it a bit. Is it stuck? Yeah. Even with the recorded demo, demo gods are punishing me. <laughs> Just a second, sorry. We'll try this one. This is nice, but it's not full screen. Okay, so this is the output XML that contains the resources with their corresponding means and standard deviations. And uh, this is some random stuff. It's not useful because uh, standard deviations for, for this web application are very scattered. As you see, the, it will go from almost zero to 300 something. But then we'll see some more examples of better results. Uh, runs on a. Then we'll see uh, runs on the real CM commercial on no commercial CMSs. This is the uh, scatter point that it generated from the real data from the XML. We have also an option to graph the, your website or whatever we could crawl from your website just for fun. And uh, so th this will sh uh, this showed you few iterations it was running of the same resources, like you see index HTML was run once and then once runs, runs again. And in the end, it will do the statistical analysis on those and will give up the uh, consolidated results.
So here we are running on a specific installation of a CMS and it comes up with a couple of resources that have high resource consumption like sitemap, surprise, surprise, login. And what we can do over that later, we can, in a, we can simulate a stress test and see what happens to a server at the time of the, of the test. So here on the top, you have a top of the web server. On the, uh, on the, on the right, you have the top of the client. And in the low left corner, we are running the attack. It's basically running the tool five times in a row. So what it will do with provided XML, it will go and uh, request those heavy resources over and over and over, in this case, thousand times. But uh, it is running only five threads, uh, five processes, and uh, only five uh, only five requests per five requests are done simultaneously. And as you can see, this server, which had four cores and eight gigs of RAM, running i7 CPU, is almost down. The idle is only. 1% where this Ubuntu box was only 9% and most of it is just the UI that is running. So that's the tool. Tool is available on GitHub and the link will be on at the end of the presentation for interested parties. So that was, that was just a simple tool written in a couple of days and to just show that there is still things to be done with, with regular get flooding. It could be done smarter. Of course, uh, attackers were always doing smart things and they probably have tools like this. But it's also good to have tools like this in the house and see how it affects your web, web server performance. So uh, what we were planning to do in the future probably is going to be this attack-like stage of testing where, where, where we basically run a couple of threads simultaneously and see how, how the resource degrades and then we go back to our calculations and we adjust to it. So this will allow us to understand if, if we really guessed well, if our time machine w worked well, basically, and if we, we are pointing out to the resources that really do degrade the server performance. So let's talk about the uh, defense against uh, tools like this, if you have a tool like this, how, uh, what would you do? Of course, protecting for, from DDoS is, uh, is a big task and it, it's not one hour talk worth thing or even not, not uh, one day worth of workshop that can do it. I mean, it's, it's really hard. But what we can still do for uh, get flooding at least, there are a few things that could be done. Uh, like uh, uh, suggestions would be using load balancers, using our tool to figure out the memory or CPU hooks and fix the bugs that you have if they are due to bugs or try to optimize your code. Uh, we will go through a couple of Apache configuration suggestions that will mitigate a get flood attacks. Uh, some Apache modules will be considered. And of course, this all will fail if a smart attacker 
is uh, you're dealing with a smart attacker because not you cannot really outsmart a talent by uh, by a machine or or a standard method, universal method of any kind. So uh, load balancers, there are a uh, few solutions in the market. I, I won't go into details, uh, but uh, most of the commercial uh, uh, vendors, the vendors of the commercial load balancers, they promise that they will fight against those, uh, those protections and mostly those are rate limiters which are not good and some, some way there are some filters and source IP checks and all of those are faulty to or clever attacks. Uh, there are also commercial cloud-based uh, denial of service protection services. Uh, again, doing almost the same things uh, as the uh, load balancers will do, because they are basically some, in some cases load balancers and or and or buffs. So resource rate uh, limitations, connection limitation, origin originating IP filtering. And in some of them have bonuses, like they have uh, defenses against uh, slow lorries uh, types of attacks. And uh, some of them, like Cloudflare, even have uh, some web application security features in them. So what, what's bad about them? They are mostly costly. And, uh, uh, we talked to a couple of real life users of those systems, they say that they won't be enabling them uh, with full throttle because they are afraid that the service degradation, I mean not service degradation, but uh, user experience degradation will appear for, for their customers. And uh, there was a uh, very good talk in uh, Black Hat this year about uh, DDoS medication, uh, medication bypassing, uh, which basically says if, if you understand how the uh, mitigation works, this uh, commercial protection services works, work, you can fool them. Basically, you are just uh, having a randomized data sent to them if there is a filter. And, I mean, if you figure out what kind of filter there is, you can fool them. Or what are the thresholds that they are set to? You go right under the threshold. So, uh, one 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 other way of uh, fighting with this uh, level seven denial of services would be using our tool, as we said, to use it as a QA instrument. Um, run it on your infrastructure. I run it on your web application infrastructure, figure out what you have, if there are uh, places where you think manual intervention is required, like there are uh, fields that could be potentially used as uh, vectors for, uh, let's say, SQL uh, wildcard injection, do that too and figure out what you have, what's heavy, what's not. Maybe use, then use protection methods. Uh, in the ideal world, our tool would generate config file for something like mod security that would take care of that. But that's probably too realistic, uh, too optimistic, so. So, uh, in a couple of minutes, we'll try to go through some uh, tweaks that we try to do with uh, a patch configuration to mitigate DOS, uh, the DOS. So what was the baseline? Baseline was one, one client, basically a laptop, running 10 power requests to most expensive resources that we identified using the tool. Uh, the laptop was using only 3% of CPU and the server running i7 with Four cores and eight gigs of RAM was maxed out on, on the CPU. 
So uh, can, could we just use Apache config to fight with it? No, not really. We couldn't find any standard config measures, but there are some uh, modules that we use. So first, first module that we tried is mod security. Basically, has uh, a way of setting per IP limit, and will block the violators. CPU usage was slight, uh, cut right right away after the system detected the violators, and uh, so the setup wasn't too hard. And uh, uh, the uh, cons of this method probably would be. As with any other limiter based solutions that we, we could limit users that have heavy usage coming from the same IP corporate networks of, of some kinds or slow uh, slow consumers. So another thing that we thought of was uh, mod security uh, kind of extension to mod security extension that would uh, sit on a server and do whatever the tool does but on a server side so it will identify the heavy resources and then figure out out of ordinary flaws that lead to the resource and uh, semi-intelligently block those out so that would be probably a bit better than this limit uh, limiter solution, but that's still a theory. Uh, there is another nice uh, module that does basically the same. It's easier to use. You just set it up, max count per IP, a number, and I will never let anybody to get above that number. Very crude method, works fine if you are a small corporation. You just want to mitigate those right away in, a, in an hour or so, in a, or 10 minutes. So basically it cuts down the CPU usage to some, uh, some number, some uh, acceptable number in our case. All the numbers that we see here are real for that uh, setup in a lab that we have. Um, mod QA is a bit better solution. So, uh, bottom line is almost the same as the limiter uh, module that we had on the previous slide, but it also has a benefit of having another setting that will mitigate uh, slow, slow doris type attacks simultaneously. Uh, this module is very complicated to set up, but it's probably probably better solution because its limiter is not crude. It has this uh, notion of uh, credit, so it will let you go a bit deeper than, than the threshold and then will start uh, closing down your connections. Mod throttle I came up I mean, I found this module, but I couldn't use it, couldn't compile it, and I got angry, and hence this slide. Mod evasive, very, very good uh, solution for majority of small businesses, we think. This really works, easy to set up. Um, that should be for that. So uh, with all with all these um, Apache models that we went through, what we think would be a problem if we also want to mitigate slow Loris type attacks, no problem there. Yeah, mod evasive couldn't protect from those, but there was mod quest for that could or uh, Apache configs config directives listed on the bottom could, could uh, help with mitigation of slow attacks. So uh, 
before jumping into commercial solutions, probably it's it's a good idea to give it a try and see how it works for your local setup. And uh, I wanted to just uh, point out this module, which sounds promising, but I don't know if it works yet. So basically what it does, it uses Project Honeypot to collect the violators, and uh, it has the IPs of all the violators, and then you could use that to blacklist them. Sounds like a good idea. So how we can use this? whatever we just described, we can use it for good, uh, use it as a QA tool, use it for stress testing, figuring out what, what goes on in a case of attack. We could use it for bad, with a uh, slightly harder ana analyzer that we don't have yet, but everybody could probably do it like running the uh, same thing in a couple of threads and see what, what happens to a machine. And uh, of course, yeah, in a very ugly way, uh, and you don't want to do that. So, back to the future, back to the ideas that we wanted to do going, on, uh, going into the future. We want to understand the, how the load balancers really work and uh, those uh, get flood attacks. We want to figure out if we can automate SQL wildcard uh, injections, maybe using the genetic algorithms. Um, see if state reset costs could be also automated, and like how dropping the cookie or uh, invalidating the session, seeing what happens there. And of course, that uh, semi-automated attacker analyzer that we talked about. So with that, I'm done. Thank you very much. And uh, here is the GitHub link to the tool. Um, if you're interested, you can download and play with it. Thank you. And the uh, references are all at the end. And uh, it wouldn't be a good talk if there is no cute kitten in it. So this is one of those two things. Thanks. And if you have any questions, sorry. The question about the more theoretical type of attack. I never saw it or heard done, but and I, I was participating in the theoretical discussion. It's an economic, D, uh, economic DOS, and the basis is that uh, some company having their website on, uh, on the cloud, so on the, some provider, you just make enough traffic and you just make it, uh, you just make enough uh, usage on the resources that the company doesn't get anything out of it because there is no customer generated, there is no sale to be done. But on the other hand, they have to pay a provider, the cloud provider, for the cycles of the CPU and uh, the memory that was consumed. So the only thing you need to do is to figure out the way to increase their, uh, increase their, yeah, the bill they are getting from the cloud provider. Did you, get, did, did you have some kind of uh, examples like that? Or? Or ter is it theoretically valid hypothesis? Uh, uh, whatever you said makes lots of sense, and, uh, and basically this could help with it. I mean, if you know that uh, he is uh, like the whoever you're trying to offend runs Joomla, and you know what's the heaviest resource that Joomla has because you did the analysis, and you're just hitting his resource, that Joomla particular Joomla resource is going to pay lots of bills, but, and you are not going to pay that much for you. It's really asymmetrical. But I, I, we, we didn't do any research towards the economical DOS that you bring brought up. No. Thanks for the idea, though.
Hi. Uh, how does your tool compare to uh, other stress testing tools uh, like JMeter or Surge, where you can also look into uh, different different paths, like different use cases with authentication, etc. What does it make it different, and how does it compare to those? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. We didn't do analysis of comparison, but the uh, main point of this tool is to just cleanly have time-based analysis, nothing else. It's, it's just predicting from the time of transfer, nothing else is in the play. And uh, the promise was to have, if you have more open, a good body of sampling, you will statistically reduce uh, a valid numbers somehow. Uh, but uh, we will we, we will plan to we are planning to run it against some other tools and see how we we do it. Thank how you. We, thank you. No more questions. All right. Oh, I want. Can you elaborate on the uh, part where you go from the uh, calling to the timing? Uh, do you do uh, a, a timing of the of the page, or do you uh, insert the parameters, and do you do fuzzing on the parameters? A good question. So, uh, so no fuzzing is done. So that would be. Your second question was if we do fuzzing and see if time changes with fuzzing. Yeah, that would be one of the future developments where part of uh, it was the SQL wildcard injection. We could also try some other things that we think are sources for internal resource consumption. It's, it wasn't done. And uh, so these are, uh, for as I remember, your first question was do we uh, time it, how do we time it? Yes? Uh, what time our clock starts? Uh, do you uh, identify the, uh, all the parameters or do you measure the page? Uh, I'm sorry, do, do we measure? Uh, the load of the page, the time. No, no we don't. Uh, so this is not uh, the, uh, the client side doesn't have any bearing here, so we don't care how long it does it take to render the page or anything. It's the transfer time that we are interested in. And uh, time from our request being sent to the time of completeness of the response. Because we, we believe that uh, re request send time is constant if you have big data, big, big number of samples large number of samples. Uh, so speed for uh, response traveling back is the same and only variance in the speed is the load on the server. So we measure the whole time from request being sent to the last byte in. Thank you. As you do more and more requests, uh, the server gets more uh, loaded. So, does the do the previous uh, requests you do not influence the latter ones because you already generate more load? Because you you try to check what is the, the most heavy page, but when you already did like 400 checks on that server, it will already be it already will have some load because you you already generated that traffic. Will it will those previous ones not influence? Yeah. So uh, that's a really good question, but maybe it will happen in a in the opposite direction. Maybe you will see better numbers, not worse numbers. In some cases we see, uh, but uh, the load we will be the alleviated because you are you stop the previous request, you stop the previous series, and then you're starting with a new series of experiments. So they are kind of independent. 
they're supposed to be independent. Unless your server died already or semi dead, and then you're just kicking it in the head. That, that is also possible. That's why you have to have a large enough number of samples to figure out if you're degrading really because of your room load or because of yeah. yeah. And a good thing would be to have the power the, to see really if you are the, uh, your, your server performance degrades because of the cumulative load or not. Okay. Thank you. That would be